When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Good evening, kitties. It is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, here to bring you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. Now, for tonight's tea, I am drinking wassail. It is a holiday spiced drink, best served hot, and that goes well with either rum, bourbon, whiskey, a number of boozes. I personally prefer black rum, though right now I am uh, settling for Barbados spiced rum. That said, a little thing about wassailing. You may have heard it before in some of those Christmas carols. Here we go, a wassailing, and all of that so keen, I don't know. Well, tradition was, once upon a time... People would go door to door, out in the snow and the cold and the wind, and sing songs of the holiday season. People within would sit there, go to the door, listen to them, and go, Wow, these poor bastards sure do look cold. Perhaps they could do with a hot cup of booze. And maybe it'll make their singing improve as well. So each house would give them, these carolers, some wassail, and by the time they were done caroling, they were well and truly smashed. That almost makes me want to go out caroling, and as all of you know, I have a perfect singing voice. Some might even call my melodious dulcet tones catawalling. <laughs> Ah, now remember, kitties, if you do wish to support this show, uh, bear in mind that while we are broadcast on renegaderadio.com, we are also billed as something of a podcast. So if you would be so kind, go to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you feed your podcast addiction, and rate this show... Don't know, maybe five stars. Five stars sounds good. And if you rate it less, well, there's a chance you might have a curse placed upon your immortal soul. Just a little chance. Now, another thing to keep in mind, kitties, is that while I am a boogeyman of class and style, this is a horror show. And some subjects might include darker language and graphic linguistic imagery. You have been warned. Now that Thanksgiving has come and gone, we are entering into the last stretch of the holiday season of 2016, wherein the old year dies, good riddance, and a new year is born. Hooray. Now, you might expect my stories to take on a more festive note, perhaps dealing with Krampus, or Jack Frost, or some other holiday boogeyman. Well, too bad. This episode will have none of that. And while future episodes might, maybe, perhaps, for tonight, the holidays are irrelevant. Beyond the tasty beverage I am imbibing, of course. Have you ever had your friends come back from vacation and say they met your doppelganger in Hawaii? Or saw someone who looked just like you while on the plane? Maybe you live in a large city and they went to a club or a bookstore and said hello to someone they swore was you but turned out to be your clone. Well, what might happen? If you met this person, if you saw someone who looked like you, acted like you, and hell, even shook their booty when they walked just like you, would you be unnerved? Would it make you uncomfortable? 
Would you find it amusing that you have a copy of yourself running around? Or would you be upset that you are not the unique little snowflake you always thought you were? Might you look at this person and see that they are a flawed attempt at copying you and realize they are merely an imposter, a, a, a horrible imitation, a cheap knockoff? Well, sit back, relax, enjoy a goblet of spiced wine, because kitties, it's story time. Knock Off by Mark Lannan I once knew a guy who looked almost exactly like me. He had the same curly brown hair, only slightly darker. He had the same crooked nose, only a bit smaller. Even our eyes were similar, both almond-shaped, but his irises were a slightly lighter shade of brown. He didn't just look like me, either. We acted similarly, talked similarly, walked similarly. The list goes on. We only had slight variations in almost every aspect of our being. It was scary at first, but soon that fear developed into anger. I absolutely hated that lousy, good-for-nothing faker. Thomas Blake was his name. I met him in my junior year of high school. He transferred toward the beginning of the school year, since apparently his father was with the army and thus had to move around often. And yes, my mother was in the army as well, and this was the third high school I had attended thus far. It was his fourth. That was a recurring theme with the variations between Thomas and I. He always seemed one step further. Not ahead, just further. When he was first introduced to the class, everybody made a huge deal about how similar we looked. Even the teacher was confused for a moment, thinking I was pulling some kind of prank. However, when they noticed me sitting in my seat at the back of class, as usual, eyes shifted between the two of us in astonishment as whispers were exchanged. In a similar state of surprise, my gaze was firmly fixed on Thomas, meeting his. Unlike me, however, he didn't appear surprised at all. He just looked at me with a slight smile as he went to take the seat the teacher pointed out for him. Said teacher always had a bit of a sense of humor. So, of course, since Thomas needed a study buddy to get him caught up on the class's lesson content, I was the man for the job. During lunch break, people swarmed us. Are you two related? One person asked. Are you like long-lost twins or something? Another hypothesized. My school had a fair amount of silly people among its student body, so all sorts of theories were thrown around. Maybe we were clones who'd escaped from a secret laboratory and gotten separated. Maybe we were the twin product of a steamy military love affair between his father and my mother, who then decided to split the two of us before leaving each other. Or maybe we were even the same person from two different timelines that had somehow intersected. The theories just kept getting more convoluted as the class had a field day with it. Now, I didn't hate Thomas from the very start. In fact, we were something akin to friends at first. Our various similarities made that easy for us. Plus, the fact that everyone else was already calling us the twins a few hours after we'd met. Since I was his study buddy, the two of us spent a fair amount of time together, and I soon introduced him to my little clique of friends. That was when he began to creep me out a little. My four friends and I were sitting at a lunch table, eating as usual, when he walked up. Hey, mind if I join you? He pointed to one of us before shifting his finger to another. And you? Yet again, he shifted his finger and repeated the question until he pointed to me. He paused for a moment, then went, And me? Everybody except for me laughed at the odd little greeting. I just looked up at him with a half-assed grin like I was attempting to find it funny, but blatantly failing. What caught me off guard was that, apart from that last bit, this was exactly how I'd first approached a group of kids in one of my last schools, word for word. Of course we invited him to sit with us, and I tried to shake off the feeling of unease that the event had left me with. I was able to forget about it for a while, 
but it wasn't long before it returned. Sure enough, as the days went on, he continued acting like me. He said things I would have said, and did things I would have done. Not that he did this all the time. The variations between us made it so that it was relatively infrequent. However, it happened often enough for me to take notice and begin to get freaked out by it. Surely it wasn't normal for someone this similar to me to suddenly appear in my life. The odds were astronomical. But no matter how I tried to rationalize the impossibility of the fact, it never made it any less true. Although Thomas hung out with my group a lot those first few weeks, he soon began to hang out with other people as well. Our school was relatively small, so it was something all of us naturally did. Most people were at least acquainted with each other, whether in a good or bad way. However, people usually stick to their particular groups of friends, having only one or two closer associates from other groups. There were a minority of people who had no particular clique, and instead had friends in many different cliques, or just fit in well with everyone. Chameleons, we called them. I myself was somewhat of a chameleon. I had many friends from other groups, but I had a specific group that I liked to hang out with the most, composed of my four closest friends. Thomas, however, was different. When he began to hang out with other people and get along quite nicely with them, my friends and I determined he would probably end up becoming a chameleon too, if only partly. But we were surprised to find that he became something more, something our school had rarely ever seen, and something that I personally hadn't seen very often either, universally popular. Now, being universally popular wasn't some kind of superpower or anything, but it was quite an achievement nonetheless. I don't know exactly how he did it, but Thomas was essentially a friend to everyone in the school. He had even befriended the loner and unpopular kids who initially hated him out of spite. He just has this charisma, some said. He's a really nice guy. I don't see why anyone wouldn't like him, said others. To them, it seemed perfectly natural to like a guy like Thomas, but it didn't make sense to me, because I had long since picked up on our similarities. If we were so similar, why was he so popular while I wasn't? Jealousy began to boil within me. What did he have that I didn't? I just couldn't understand it. But as I observed him and spent time with him, I realized I had been so focused on the similarities between us, I had failed to notice the variations. They ended up making all the difference. Thomas was more confident. He was slightly more handsome, had higher grades, and had a bit of an accent since he had lived in England for a time. Whatever we had in common, his variation was almost always better. That was when jealousy gave way to hatred. Not of Thomas, however, of myself. For a while, I hated myself for not being as good as Thomas. The feeling of insecurity ate away at me for over two months, causing my grades to drop and my health to go down as I spent most of my time isolated. Friends tried to comfort me to no avail. My family tried to get me to see a psychiatrist or therapist, but I refused. I looked to the internet for help with what I had come to believe was probably some form of depression, but despite all the good and bad advice, none of it seemed to change anything. Imagine my surprise then when all that it took to solve my problem was a trip to the dollar store. I had gone there with my father to buy something or other. As my dad looked for it, I got bored and wandered off to the toy section, where I gazed absent-mindedly at the cheap crap that passed for toys here. If you've ever been to a dollar store, you know that the merchandise they sell isn't exactly top-notch, and the kids' items are no exception. Countless rip-offs of famous toys littered the section. Robo-formers, action rangers, barber girls, that kind of near-copyright infringement thing. As I looked at them, I began to realize the case wasn't so different from my own situation. The Robo-formers were almost exactly like Transformers, but there were a few minor differences to keep some small-time Chinese company from getting sued. And that's exactly what Thomas was. He was just a cheap rip-off version of me. It wasn't evident at first. I mean, Thomas was better than me, wasn't he? 
When I re-evaluated him with this in mind, however, I found him to be quite different. His confidence was obnoxious, bordering on outright overconfidence. His grades were only higher than mine because I and many others had helped him study. His English accent was only faint and most likely somewhat forced. No matter how I looked at it, he was nothing but a faker, and so my hatred shifted from me onto him. With the problem of my insecurity gone, I returned to school and gradually returned to normal. I felt much better knowing that I was the original and he was just a bad imitation masquerading as something better. I could easily fake who I was and become like him as well, but I wasn't that pathetic. I would stay true to who I was. Still, the problem wasn't entirely gone. Thomas and I still talked fairly often, and the more I saw him around, the more annoyed I got. It got to the point where simply hearing him speak would immediately flip my mood, regardless of what it was before. I knew that I couldn't keep being friendly for long, so I gradually tried to drift away from him, even if it meant staying away from a few of my other friends as well. It didn't work. Even when I didn't approach him, he approached me. Whenever I tried to leave him, he would flash that small smile that looked sickeningly similar to mine and try to convince me to stay. I hated him. I hated him so much that words could not even describe it. Everything he did only served to fuel the fire within me. Whenever I got the chance, I began to daydream about calling him out on his fakery and beating him up as a suitable punishment. These daydreams soon evolved into hypothetical plans of increasing complexity as I mulled over ways to get him expelled from school and out of my life forever. Then my mom made an unprecedented announcement. We were leaving. Her work required her to be stationed in New York, so I couldn't stay in my school. At first I rejoiced. Finally, Thomas Blake would be out of my life forever. A couple of months passed, and the week of the move came, so I said goodbye to all of my friends and acquaintances, and unfortunately Thomas, before leaving my school. But I didn't feel as good as I thought I would. Initially I believed that getting away from Thomas was what I needed, but he just stayed on my mind. I was confused. Why couldn't I stop hating him, even after I'd never have to see him again? He was irrelevant now, after all. I could just leave him behind and start a new life somewhere else, where I was the only me. But no. I soon realized that no matter where I was on this planet, I simply couldn't condone a cheap rip-off of myself still existing out there, acting like he was better than me. Even if I never had to see him again, I'd know he still existed and that would eat away at me forever. There was only one way I could solve the problem. I had to stop him from existing. But could I really go through with killing him? Coming up with a plan wasn't too hard, since I knew where he lived as well as the layout of his house. As much as my hatred compelled me, however, fear of the potential consequences halted me. In the end, I didn't even need to take the initiative. About a week before the scheduled time for the move, I got a call from none other than my would-be doppelganger. Hey, Travis, want to hang out? Thomas asked nonchalantly. I know you're leaving soon, so I was thinking we should go somewhere one last time. I asked James and Sarah, but neither of them are available, so I guess it's just us. I couldn't help but smile at the opportunity. Maybe if I could get him all alone and make sure nobody found his body for a while, it could work. I was moving away soon anyway. All right. Where you want to go? How about we head to the mall? Thomas suggested. There's some stuff I need to pick up there anyway. All right. I replied. How's tomorrow? And with that, the deal was sealed. That night, I went out to set things up for my grand plan. The following day, I met Thomas at the mall just like we arranged. My mom's switchblade stuffed into my pocket for later use. All I needed to do was lead him to some secluded part of town on our way back home. 
I knew the town's layout better than he did, so I could just tell him I knew a shortcut. I kept telling myself it'd be easy, but my heart raced the entire time we were at the mall. We acted all buddy-buddy as we usually did, despite the fact that I was just itching to jab my knife into his stomach every second of the day. There he was, right in front of me, that stinking copycat, talking and acting just like me, even though he wasn't. Yet I couldn't do anything, not until that evening. The time eventually came, and the two of us decided to walk back to my house. I told him of the supposed shortcut, and I led him to a relatively small park by the river that ran through town. I had been thorough in my preparations. The previous night, I'd buried a weight and a rope in a thicket of trees nearby, so that I could eventually tie him up and throw him into the river after killing him. There were some rowboats tied to the docks a little ways out from the park, so I could simply steal one of those, row a little further up the river, and dump the body. Lastly, actually killing him wouldn't be a problem either. I'd received a little hand-to-hand -hand combat training from my mom, so I knew the quickest and most effective ways to end a life. As the cool autumn breeze stung our faces, we walked up into the park. I expected Thomas to be surprised and presume we had gotten lost or something, but he did nothing. He just stopped at the river bank and stared into the river. Heh. <laughs> I always did like rivers. Thomas spoke out as I stood behind him. Slowly, cautiously, I withdrew my switchblade. You never know what's underneath that ever-flowing surface of theirs, he continued. What someone could have... hidden. I wasn't going to wait any longer. I held the knife backhand and went for a stab, aiming for his jugular. I was surprised, however, when he ducked right on time, and it was only then that I noticed the shiny object in his hand. Another knife. Thomas immediately tried to slash me, but I jumped back in time to avoid him. He stood up straight, his face somewhat obscured by shadow as the sun set behind him, yet I was sure I could make out a slight smile on his expression. I'm really hoping you were smart enough to come prepared for this, he said, taking a step forward as he got into an attacking position. I mean, I know you're not as intelligent as I am. But surely even a knockoff like you has watched enough movies to know how to plan a murder. In retrospect, I think I should have felt surprised, or at least fear that my plan had gone awry. However, the only emotion I could register was anger. My hatred flared as I listened to his words. You think I'm the knockoff here? I exclaimed, gripping my switchblade tighter and preparing for his attack. Sorry to break it to you, but you're the only faker. And I can't let you prance around thinking you're better than me any longer. Thomas scoffed. Of course. That's the only way you can justify your existence, isn't it? Accusing me of being the ripoff, thinking you're the improved original version. But you're wrong, he boasted. I am the original. I am me. And you are just a lowly, imperfect copy trying to be me. Maybe if you were a complete clone, I could condone it. But the fact that a piece of trash like you, who is inferior in every way, is out there, that's something I can't allow. He stepped forward, taking a jab at me with his knife. I swiped it to the left with mine before taking the opening and sidestepping to the right, slashing once again at his throat. He tried to jump back, but my knife still managed to cut deep into his shoulder. Blood spat out onto my clothes, and Thomas roared as it continued to leak down his arm. Fuck! He exclaimed as he gripped his shoulder with his free hand. His smile had deteriorated into a look of disgust and anger as he eyed me. Meanwhile, I had gained some confidence. With his right shoulder damaged, it would be more painful to swing his knife. I had gained the advantage. You fucking trash! How dare you! Thomas growled. I gave a slight smile. Isn't it obvious? Because you're nothing but a second-rate imitation, I'm the real one here. I informed him. It stands to reason that a piece of shit like you wouldn't even be able to touch me. Yes, I could see it now. Why was I even angry in the first place? This pathetic copy, with delusions of grandeur, couldn't touch me. His better counterpart. Yeah, keep talking. I've heard it all before, Thomas spat. But surely even you see it. You're just worse than me in every way. Unlike you, I've proved myself. 
I've gotten rid of trash like you before, and I'm not afraid to do it again. I scoffed. He was just talking nonsense now, probably trying in vain to convince himself that he was real. Deciding to go on the attack this time, I reached down and grabbed a handful of rocks lying on the riverbank. I threw all of them at Thomas, and he instinctively used his arm to shield his eyes. That was when I lunged, aiming for his right arm in order to incapacitate him. I wasn't fast enough, and he was able to parry my slash before quickly grabbing my wrist with his free hand. Holding it in place, he lifted up his knife. But as it came down to strike my trapped arm, I grabbed his wrist just in time. With the two of us now locked this way, we began to push each other back and forth, struggling to hold our footing on the rocks beneath us. You'll see, Thomas grunted as he pushed. I am the original. I waited this long so I could prove it again. He pushed against me, knocking me onto the ground. He was now on top of me and pushing his knife ever closer to my chest. But still, for some reason, I felt no fear. I had nothing to worry about from him. I knew it. Thomas, however, looked far more agitated than when we had begun this little duel. Only the original survives, he said through bared teeth as he struggled against me. I knew you deluded yourself into thinking you could win. I wanted to see you fail, to see the look in your eyes when I kill you, and you see that I'm... His final words were cut short as my blade pierced his chest and his eyes widened in utter shock. I guess this must be that look he was talking about. Indeed, it was quite an amusing sight, the look of a worthless imitator finally being put in his place. I liked it very much. Luckily, the hand he had been holding my knife back with was still covered in blood from his shoulder injury, which had caused it to slip and my knife to be the first one in. I could feel the strength leaving his body as I pushed him off of me and sat up. I looked over to his convulsing form on the ground, that expression never leaving his face as he slowly struggled to look at the knife that had pierced his heart. Taking it out would only make more of a bloody mess, so I left it where it was. I smirked triumphantly as I waited for the life to fade from his eyes. Blood sputtered from his mouth as he tried to speak, but failed. The last words he would ever hear were but the simple truth. You never even stood a chance, you cheap knockoff. The rest of the procedure went smoothly. Under the cover of darkness, I brought the body over to the boat before retrieving my weight and rope from the thicket of trees. My jacket had been bloodied during the fight, so I removed it and buried it in the hole. My face and hair were a little bloody as well but that was easily taken care of with a quick rinse in the river water. With the knife also thrown into the water with the body, all that was left was the blood stain he'd left on the rocks, which was cleaned up quickly by the tide. Seeing the blood get washed away, it occurred to me that Thomas had probably gone there intentionally to make sure that when he killed me, he wouldn't have to bother cleaning up the blood himself. It seemed he had planned my murder by counting on me to plan his, which made me wonder how he knew. He said he'd proven himself before, but I had no idea what that meant at the time. I didn't wonder about it for very long either, as I was too caught up in my victory to care much. The last few days passed like the breeze. The police came to question me about the disappearance of Thomas a couple of days after he'd been reported missing, since I was the last person he'd been seen with. I just told them that the last time I saw him was when he and I went separate ways to get to our houses, and this answer seemed to satisfy them. They probably assumed he had run away or something, like most missing kids. It didn't really matter, because two days later, I was out of there and off to New York. Only then did I feel truly successful, uncaught and untouched. I was now indisputably the one and only Travis Burke. That summer was probably one of the best of my life. With my identity now to myself, I felt far better than I ever had before. And it showed. I began attending a youth group at my new local church and made friends with the people there. It was surprisingly easy, far less awkward than it had been before. 
of particular interest was one girl, Leslie, who would later even become my girlfriend after I worked up the nerve to ask her out. The people from the youth group quickly introduced me to their other friends, and it wasn't long before I was well acquainted with everyone in most of their social circles. Things were going better than they ever had before. The entire time, though, a lot of people kept saying something odd. I swear I've seen your face somewhere before, they would always tell me upon meeting me. It troubled me because I thought news of Thomas Blake's disappearance might have gotten widespread enough to reach the next state over. Of course, this wasn't the case. In hindsight, I probably should have known what the real cause was. And so I stand here today. As I enter my new classroom, today at the beginning of my senior year, my eyes scan the room full of students. I take in the faces of those I don't recognize, making a mental note to talk to them later. Then I look over the ones I do know from last summer and my eyes rest on one particular young man who's looking back at me with a surprised expression. I glossed over him earlier, having recognized him all too well despite never having met him. He has slightly lighter brown curly hair, a slightly larger crooked nose, and even almond-shaped eyes with a darker tint to the iris's chocolate brown. It isn't long before the rest of the class notices, and eyes begin to shift between the two of us as whispers are exchanged. I'm less surprised about this than I think I should be, really. Realizing what Thomas must have been talking about the day I killed him, I can't help but smile slightly. It doesn't matter what he said, though. Unlike him, I am the original, and I know it. I couldn't be killed by Thomas, and I certainly can't be beaten by this guy either. He's just another knockoff that I'll have to put in his place. Welcome back, kitties! I do hope you enjoyed that y- Tale? It would appear that Travis Burke is operating under the impression that there can be only one curly-haired, crooked-nosed, brunette, military brat with brown, almond-shaped eyes in this world. <laughs> I smell a deathmatch reality show. <laughs> it looks like poor Thomas was the weakest link in this week's episode. Alas, that's, that's, that's all I have for that. Uh, jokes escape me. Even the bad ones... I guess I need more rum in my wassail. Well, for our next story, we have a conversation with a Mr. Denel, who recounts to us his encounter with a strange, inhuman creature. He likens it to cryptozoological curiosities like the Chupacabra, the Mothman, and even Spring-Heeled Jack. But his personal encounters with this bizarre boogeyman have a much more lasting impact upon him. So pull up a seat, relax, enjoy a hot mug of something or other, and let's see what results from Mr. Dennell's investigation into The Grinning Man. The Grinning Man by N. Harley February 20th, 1979. August 15th, 1975. That was the first time. You ever heard of cryptozoology? The study of hidden animals as it is officially defined, but often mixed up with talk of UFOs and aliens and other such crap? <laughs> I must admit, I've always been fascinated by urban legends. The Mothman of West Virginia, the Chupacabra in the South... Hell, even those old-timey reports of freaks like Spring-Heeled Jack, who is clearly just some madman in a costume. But I don't go for the big ones. Those sensationalized glory hounds like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. <laughs> Please. No, I'm fascinated more by those that are localized. You know, the ones that are first mentioned by some nut in some pissy little town as you get lost on the way to nowhere and that don't suddenly have appearances all over the country. They always seem to have a kernel of truth hidden in them, and are, 
most of the time far harder to explain away. Anyway, one in particular caught my eye that night as I trawled through the old newspapers that my father had squirreled away in the attic. He too lived with a fascination for the inexplicable and had heavily researched legends and mysteries in the years leading up to his death. The paper I found was a yellowing copy of the Daily Journal of Elizabeth, New Jersey, dated October 12, 1966. Highlighted by my father was a small paragraph, almost as an afterthought, reporting that two boys, Martin Munov and James Yanchitis, had been harassed by a strange figure on their way home the night before. There was no real description, just a warning for anyone who had seen anyone strange in the area to report it to police. The article was titled, Who is the Grinning Man? Mr. Dennell pauses to take a sip of water from the decanter between us. My dictaphone whirs softly in the silence. I wouldn't have taken much notice. I mean, the Grinning Man? That's got to be the worst name for a mysterious being since the Melon Heads of Michigan. But I found it odd that my father had been interested enough to keep the report, so I dug. It took me almost a month after his death to clear that attic of old newspapers and half-completed scrapbooks. And in that time, I found only one other mention of the Grinning Man, this time in a clipping from another 66 newspaper. It mentioned a fellow who claimed to have been stopped on the road by a tall man with a wide grin, who conversed without moving his lips. Interesting as it sounded, it wasn't exactly a lot to go on. Nevertheless, when we sold his house, I kept both the clippings along with a few other mystery-filled scrapbooks found buried in the mess. In the weeks that followed, I began to notice a nagging feeling. That same itch I got whenever something feels unfinished. Carol used to call it my busy radar, and used to complain that I was never happy unless I was working. He smiles, apparently lost in thought. Eventually, it was pure coincidence that I truly started investigating the question of the grinning man. I was reporting on Hurricane Eloise for the New York Times in September of 1975 and had been sent to New Jersey City to compare damages to those suffered in New York. Fucking waste of time that was. Sent to report on light floods that caused little to no property damage while my own city was smashed by the torrent. My busy radar hadn't stopped itching. Finding myself with free time, I recalled that the first sighting of the Grinning Man had been in Elizabeth, not ten miles from the city center. On a whim, I went in search of the two boys mentioned in the first of my father's articles, doubting that they'd still be in the area, but intrigued, or bored enough to find out. It took a while, but eventually I made contact with James Anchitis, now in his early twenties, who agreed to meet with me. As I shook his hand outside a cafe that evening, my first thought was how withdrawn he looked, as though he hadn't slept a full night in a very long time. The story he told me was far more informative than the article had suggested, and far more chilling. Mr. Dennell falls silent. After an extended pause, he reaches into his pocket and places a little cassette player on the table next to my dictaphone and thumbs the play button. It is a poor quality recording, and the voice that crackles out of it is quite young. Throughout, Mr. Dennell doesn't say a word. We were walking home. It was dark, but the street lights lit enough for us to see, you know? I was nervous. Miss Lloyd claimed to have been chased by a strange man in the area earlier that night, and while Martin teased me about it, I could see he was pretty freaked too. But I was the first to see him. Across the road and behind the fence was a tall hill that lit up to the turnpike. And it was steep, you know? Like, real steep. At the bottom of the other side of the fence was just scrubland, and in it was a figure. I remember hitting Martin and pointing at it. From what I could see, it was a man standing mostly in shadow, turned so that he were looking half at his back, half at his side. He was staring straight ahead, like uh, at a house across the road or something. He didn't move when I stopped Martin, but when I pointed at him, he turned slowly. As his bald head swiveled to face us, I noticed one thing immediately. He was grinning, leering, like really wide. He pivoted on the spot and stared straight at us. But his eyes were messed, massive and black. Fuck, man, we were frozen. It was terrifying. Martin was the first to move. He took a step backwards. The man didn't move, just stared, arms limply by his sides. That was all we needed. We bolted, not waiting for him to climb the fence and come after us. 
I, I glanced over my shoulder once as we ran, and it was like he hadn't moved. But, but he was now on our side of the fence. Nor had his eyes strayed from staring at us, or his grin. So wide. Terrifying. The cassette crackles for a few seconds more before falling silent with a click. Mr. Dennell slowly reaches out and picks it up, placing it in his back pocket. Yanchitis struggled to say much more. But he did give me a basic description. Tall, well over six feet, wearing a dark green overcoat. But it was a face that was the most defining feature. The insane grin on a pale face that stuck into his memory and haunted him every night. As Mr. Dennell pauses again, I can't help glancing around furtively myself. The room is empty, nobody but my interviewee and myself. The table between us is strewn with papers, all blank. The floor behind is still closed, and the light above illuminates the room brightly, almost harshly, despite the late hour. Mr. Dennell continues. I didn't sleep much that night. My imagination was running rampant. All I could picture was the man Yanchitis had described. When I closed my eyes, his grin followed me, and in all my dreams, he haunted me. But that was before I really knew what haunted meant. It happened two days later, as I pulled up to a gas station on the road out of New Jersey. By this point, Mr. Dennell is becoming increasingly agitated. His hands are twitching, and his voice is increasingly strained, even frightened. Oh, it was dark. Probably nine-ish, maybe closer to ten. I had just filled up and was climbing back into my car when I noticed something in the laneway beside the station. The lane was dark, but a streetlight on the other end illuminated enough for me to catch sight of a figure near the other side. It had its back to me, but I could make out that it was tall. Taller than me, wearing a dark gray suit over a thin frame. It was bald. And even from behind, I could tell that something was off. As though proportions were slightly wrong, or it held itself strangely. Even with a sense of fear growing in me, I called out. I regret that probably more than any other decision I've made in my life. It swiveled so suddenly and so quickly that I shouted out loud. Its face, its face was wrong. White, long, with deep black holes where the eye should be. But its mouth, it was grinning. A locked grin that was far too wide, far too big. No human can make that expression. Hands by its side, it grinned at me down the laneway, but made no further move. After a few seconds, I glanced away to look inside the station, see if there was anyone who could help. When I turned back, it had moved closer. I hadn't seen it walk. I didn't see it take a single step. In the second or so, I had glanced away. It had advanced at least ten feet and now stood halfway down the lane in the darkness. Only its face could be seen, split in half by the blackness of the alley, and it was unchanged, still staring, still grinning. I have never seen anything more subtly threatening or more unquestionably. I crouched, never taking my eyes off it, and fumbled for the handgun under the seat of my car. I couldn't find it, and in my fear I glanced away again. When I stood, pistol in hand, it was closer still. It stood grinning, not twenty feet away from me at the entrance of the laneway, face in total darkness, but for the eyes boring into mine. The grin fixed and horrifying. I couldn't help it. I yelled and fired my gun, a bullet hitting it straight, bang in the stomach. The damn thing didn't react, didn't make a sound, didn't even twitch as that bullet hit it. In terror, I unloaded the clip straight into its chest. It was like nothing had happened. I lost it. I freaked out. Screaming and crying, I leapt into my car, rammed in the keys, and gunned the engine, tearing off down the road without even closing the door. I got one glance through the rearview mirror. It was on the road, watching my car fading into the distance, its eyes unmoving, and its grin frozen. I didn't stop the car again until the sun rose. Mr. Dennell's glass hits the floor. He is frozen, breathing deeply, shuddering occasionally. I suggest that we take a break. 
Continue our interview tomorrow, but he waves the suggestion away. He doesn't seem to notice the glass shattered at his feet. Over the coming days and weeks, sleep became a fantasy beyond my grasp. Every time I closed my eyes, it was there. A ghastly specter that inhabited my dreams and haunted my every waking moment. I began to see it everywhere I went. Never clearly, never for more than a moment, but it was there. A silhouette on my wall, a figure at the end of a dark street. A face glimpsed in every crowd. I wasn't eating, I couldn't concentrate on my work. So sure was I that if I let my guard down for a second, it'd be there. The fear that it was following me became too much. I found myself hunting for it. Desperate to catch sight of it for more than a second. To prove that it was real. To make sure that I wasn't mad. I became obsessed. Simultaneously frantic to find and terrified to encounter it. Carol could only watch helplessly as my terror consumed me. This continued for far too long, until eventually I found it again. A soft clinking can be heard as Mr. Dennell shifts in his seat, his dark glasses hiding pain-filled eyes from my sight. Three years had passed since my encounter with the grinning man. Three long years of insomnia and terror, of paranoia and isolation. I had long since lost my job. I would rarely leave my study, working feverishly into the night to uncover further clues on the specter that haunted me. Only Carol stood by me, worried but faithful, loving more than I reciprocated and far more than I deserved. It was late. I was in the study. Carol was downstairs in the living room. I could hear the muffled sounds of the television leaking through the floorboard under my feet. A tapping at my window snapped me from my work. Three slow beats, too rhythmic to be natural. Tap, tap, tap. Mr. Dennell beats the tables with his knuckles for emphasis. I would have no doubt ignored it if it weren't for one factor. I was on the second floor, with no trees near this side of the house. The blinds were down. I, I couldn't see out. My heart began hammering as I edged toward the windowsill, pen still in hand, reaching slowly for the string to raise the blinds. Tap, tap, tap. I leaped back as it repeated, and it was a long minute before I steeled the nerve to approach it again. With a deep breath, I grabbed the string and heaved the blinds open. Nothing. No bald face, no staring eyes, no fixed grin, nothing. I fell back into my chair. Unsure whether to laugh or cry with relief. What had I expected, really? I seemed to recall that I laughed, chuckling to myself as my heart rate slowed. Until there came a piercing scream from downstairs. Adrenaline fired into my veins, and I leapt to my feet as the scream came again. Carol. Without hesitation, I wrenched the door wide and charged downstairs, calling out, shouting her name. Wheeled in my pen like a dagger. Through the living room, empty. Down the hall, silent. Into the kitchen. Into a scene of nightmare. The lights were on. Bright, too bright, illuminating everything in perfect detail. The back door was open wide. The kitchen lights spilling out onto the porch. Cutlery was strewn all over the floor and Carol lay in the middle of the tiles. She was lying on her stomach, but she was face up. Her head had been turned until it faced fully backwards. Her eyes, her wide eyes staring straight at me and a grin on her face. A locked grin that was far too wide, far too big. She was dead, yet her eyes pierced me. The grin taunted me, haunted me, and I screamed. I screamed and I screamed and fell to my knees, unable to move, to breathe, to think. Her face was burned into my eyes, merging with the mask of horror that already plagued my every living moment. I couldn't approach her. Didn't dare touch the corpse that had once been my wife. My beacon of support. I turned and stumbled into the hall. 
crashing through the living room door where the television was still playing, filling the room with laughter. The sound consumed everything. Laughter, constant, unchanging, driving me into a fit of blind panic with a roar I leapt up, intent on smashing the infernal machine into a million pieces. But something stopped me. It was off. The television was black, dead. Yet the laughter still echoed through the room, growing louder and more unnatural with every second. I lifted the box and slammed it into the floor, again and again, shattering the glass, splintering the wood, and yet still the laughter did not stop. Hands bloodied, tears streaming down my face, I plunged back into the hallway, tearing up the staircase to my study for the phone, desperate to call someone, anyone for help. The room was as I had left it. Desk messy, lights dim, blinds raised, except that a face now stared through the glass. White, long, with gaping black eyes, too far apart that locked into mine and didn't waver. It was grinning. A fixed grin that was far too wide, far too big. No human can make that expression. Mr. Dennell is in a frenzy. He strains and tears at the cuffs that bind him to his seat. I grab my dictaphone and leap to my feet as he manages to upturn the table, sending papers flying across the white floor of his cell, some fluttering into the two-way glass window behind me. Still locked into the chair, bolted into the floor. It's a long while before he calms down enough to continue. His voice exhausted, his tone dead. I, I couldn't look away. It was there. He was there, as he'd always been. Watching me. His face was seared into my eyes. Carol's face was seared into my eyes. Denying me escape from the nightmare I had been plunged into. I would never be free of his torment. Unless I... I stood up again. Locked my gaze with the demon. The pen was still in my hand. I plunged it into my eye, first one, then the other. Agony raged as an inferno as I fell to the floor, succumbing to the blackness. But now I was free. Now I was free of ever seeing that creature again. Mr. Dennell's head slumps in exhaustion, and his sunglasses drop to the floor. Then he begins to laugh, slowly, quietly, <laughs> growing louder and louder until he raises his head and stares at me with eyes that are no longer there. Black holes in a pale face, twisted into a mask of insane laughter. I back away from the chair, from the man chained to the center of the room, turning for the door. As I slam my fist into it, I glance down at one of the blank pages that had been thrown to the floor. Not blank, just upside down. The other side was now revealed. A charcoal sketch of a face. It was grinning. A demonic visage. No human could make that expression. As the door was opened from the outside, I stumbled out, throwing one last look into the cell I had just left. Mr. Dennell was still laughing maniacally, the chains holding him to his chair, the floor littered with hundreds upon hundreds of blank pages, which were now revealed to be drawings. All drawings, all of one thing, a face with a locked grin that was far too wide, far too big. I shuddered and slammed the door closed. Welcome back, kitties. I do hope you enjoyed that yaw story. Honestly, I didn't think there was anything truly bizarre about a fast, grinning person who was quite adept at climbing and enjoyed wearing Kevlar armor under his suit. Though it does sound like he had something of a disease, one could say he had an infectious grin. <laughs> well, kitties, 
I do believe that is our show for the evening. Alas, my friends, the time has come. For it appears our stories are done. I am afraid that I must fly. But do come back and please, don't cry. <laughs> The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission or creative commons. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m., Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on Facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat, or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>